In a world full of distractions, there is one big question on every dog owner's lips. How do I become more than just the person holding the other end of the leash? We all get dogs with a dream in mind, a vision of the future. And if right now your everyday reality isn't quite that picture you had in mind, you are in the right place. It really doesn't have to be this way. You absolutely can and will be more to your dog than just the person who gets in between them and the world. The key is you need to be more sexy. More sexy than the neighbourhood cats. More sexy than the jogger in the park. More sexy than that half-eaten hamburger they just found on the floor. And yes, even more sexy than the dog across the road. I'm Tom. And I'm Lauren. Together Together we're we're Absolute Dogs. Dogs. And you're listening to the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast, the podcast that teaches you how to be the very best dog owner your dog could ever wish for, and also be friends with your neighbours. Be friendly (laughs) with your neighbours. So here we have a struggle, and this struggle is one that's come into us. It's come in via our Facebook page, and it's come in via Sexier Than a Squirrel Facebook page, the Game Changer community. So this is a real-life struggle, and I think I'm going to read it because I think when I read it, you'll be able to to sort of, um, well, it will resonate with you. Yeah, for and sure. if you've ever had this struggle or if you've got a neighbor with this struggle, or maybe you have a neighbor who could listen to this, then please link them in. So here we go. And this read just a little like this. One of my neighbors has just put a letter through my door. Now, this letter is complaining about my dog's barking and this upsets me hugely. He's threatened me with the next step. And that next step is going to be the local council or if I do not do something about it. Now, this scares me. He works shifts and I own two Labradors. They are loud when they bark. They're big dogs. I know I need to work on calm. I know I could do more and I know I could be, do um, better as an owner. I feel they get very excited very quickly. Uh, can anyone help? Please help. Give me any advice on anything I can do to improve this. I really don't want to get the council involved. Brilliant. So, first of all, you've come to the right place. And secondly, this is a really common struggle that we get contacted about. So you're really not alone in this. Um, You know, having neighbors, especially if they themselves don't have dogs, especially if you're working through some struggles with your dogs um, at the moment, it's, you you know, you're in a, you're in a, a normal place. And what we want you to be in is a good place. And so we've been contacted thousands, tens of thousands of times about this struggle. There is hope, there is a game for that, and there absolutely are things that you can do both kind of in the short term, kind of action plan, firefighting, let's get this under control, and also in the long term as well. I think what's really worth saying here and reiterating is just what Tom said there, you are not alone. There are so many people that go through this. There are so many people that experience this. This is a way more common problem than you you might see. And I suppose a level of perspective in it that this is is quite typical and there's lots we can do about it. So I know sometimes we need to hear something a couple of times. I, mm-hmm. I just needed to reiterate that knowing that um, it's really important you know this is a a problem shared. Yeah, absolutely. There is a game for that. So um, what we'll do is we'll kind of give you what would be kind of our top... 10 tips on on what what we see as being vital in terms of and getting on top of this struggle. This is something that both Tom and I experienced, Tom having um, really close neighbours mm. and me actually having very close holiday cottages. Yeah. And so because yeah. we have, again, neighbours, like we have a lot of neighbours. Exactly. I, and I remember I lived on the, the main street in Bristol city centre while I was at vet school. Um, and I had um, one and two, two dogs at times. Um, and so, you know, that wasn't even like neighbors that was in like a a, a flat above a shop right so and, and I, I mean I it's, know it's something well. we experience and I, I mean I experience here here on a daily basis and I know our trainers experience it mm-hmm. here having um people come here to visit and and stay so actually this is something I, f- I feel we're pretty expert yeah. in right Tom yeah absolutely so um first things first um what we want to think about is what we can do right now and so um often you know garden manners but you're dog's behavior in the garden and it can be impacted by a few different things and I think the key is if your dog's behavior isn't as you want it to be when they spend time in the garden right now we have to probably actually limit the amount of time that they're in the garden and rehearsing that behavior. An example of that would be I have a dog 
garden at the side mm. of my house so i have a garden that i use for my dogs to be able to go in mm. they could chew on recreational bones they can sit in the sun they can paddle in the paddling pool mm. they can stretch out and enjoy themselves however that is a privilege not a right yeah. so my dogs don't get that garden as a right they don't just have full access to that garden so let's say classic my mini mm. american shepherd very very vocal very very noisy can easily trigger on other dogs barking does she get free access to the garden automatically no this is something we we gradually grow yeah. yes she does now did she has a puppy no. no and so actually this is something we had to i suppose um allow her to earn that um and and it wasn't something that just came in a week or two this was something that probably took if i'm honest maybe six seven months yeah Tom. exactly and we what we do is we pitch the level of the responsibility that we put on our dogs based on where their skills are at right now and you can think of it as almost four levels The you know the top level where all the responsibility is on our dogs they get to spend prolonged periods outside in the garden exploring you know playing in the paddling pool and whatever I'll, else i'll give an example yesterday it was a really beautiful day here absolutely glorious and classic got to spend two and a half hours yeah. whilst i was out busy teaching she had a venison bone mm -hmm. she was um had a paddling pool she had uh, a sun lounger yeah. and she got to spend that time doing really yeah. as she pleased Be however would we have done that initially and like absolutely said, because not because her, what we've got now is a dog whose skills can take that level of responsibility now you drop down a level to maybe a slightly less experienced dog maybe let's the take, skills are needed your, your, your youngster so yeah, she let's actually take, let's take um, magma okay my young standard poodle she's one year old she can she can be in the garden and she can be in the garden and um you know have lots of choices and let's I wouldn't... say the cows just start to wander up to yeah, your, your fence because cows that does in happen my garden. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a unique situation and um, <laughs> and the point is is that i wouldn't leave her in the in that space for prolonged periods so for example i would not leave her for the two hours that classic can be left because she'll find the choices quite exhausting and she's making great choices making great choices and then a cow tempts her and maybe she will not make the and right choice just for you guys to ensure that you understand um, our position both of us have completely secure gardens <laughs> and we're both still um, in the property or yeah. on the property um, it's more uh, we might be working at our desk yeah. or I might be running around the yard and so our, our, our gardens are really secure and obviously mm. what we're not suggesting is you leave your dogs in gardens if they are not completely no. dog secure and we are both on site at the time mm -hmm. um, but what we're saying is there might be um, so we both live in the Devon countryside there might be cows in the neighbouring field yeah. those wandering up close to our fence would create for us chaos now you might live in a different scenario you mm -hmm. might live in a town center yeah. so yours might be traffic yours might be passers the by neighbor having a barbecue yours right? might be the next door cat yeah. i mean you've all got a uh, distraction all you need to do is is, is replace your your cows with something else yeah absolutely. right like insert here yeah exactly so there, there are four levels top level of responsibility prolonged periods in the garden free to make their own choices drop that down a level and it is that they're unsupervised in the garden but maybe not for quite the you know length of time that the top level would allow now you drop that down a level again to maybe dogs that aren't necessarily going to make the right choices all the time and what we see is that actually we need to be supervising them in the garden so we need to be out there with them when they are in the garden now the nice thing about this is it allows us to direct their choices a little bit it allows us to reward them when they make the right choice so that we can promote this further and therefore over time give them more responsibility now you drop that level down even further um you know what our young our very young dogs very kind of inexperienced dogs probably for the first at least for the first few times that they go out into the garden they need to learn that's a calm place they need to learn that's a place to maybe go to the toilet and therefore they might go out on lead so actually we're really directing their choices now, and helping them out when tom says puppies he completely also um will incorporate within that dogs who actually you're taking back a level and yeah. think they need to, to work this way so don't feel bad if you have a classic who is five years old and needs to go back on lead for a bit yeah. if i spend three months taking my dog out on lead and i at the end get a result like i have with with my dogs in the garden that is three months Absolutely. well spent you revisit earlier stages sometimes and this is really kind of in a constant state of flux and that sometimes you look at you know you you look at your dog's behavior and you think how did that happen i need to revisit some stages here and that's totally or fine you might go through a stage where i don't know your dog's maybe a little bit we, we have one at the moment who's been a little bit 
hormonal. We have to revisit stages mm -hmm. because she's become a little bit hormonal over the last couple of weeks and decided that barking at people is okay. You know what? Barking at people isn't something we need. Let's revisit some stages. And I've actually taken her out of that. That's not a responsibility I'm giving you right now. Exactly. So that's the first tip is really thinking about where you are right now. What level of responsibility do you think you can give your dog? And if in doubt, the you can give your dog the level of responsibility whereby they still behave perfectly. So if they, I don't know, if you give them, you, you try a level three in that little example we gave, right? So they're outside unsupervised for periods of time that aren't super long, but you get quite a bit of barking in that time, then we're just going to drop down a level and we're actually going to be out there and supervise them. But if you find even when you're supervising them, their behavior maybe isn't quite what you're after, we drop them down a level and we just pop them on lead. For a, a and I week. think the important thing is here that you don't feel bad about that. You don't no. feel like you've done anything wrong. You don't feel like you have um, been a bad owner in any way. This is you being a great owner and you actually recognizing that your dog cannot handle that responsibility yeah. right now and you need some of it. Yeah. And the cool thing is, is that, you know, helping this game changer out, actually that means that the what you implement right now is going to immediately reduce the amount that your neighbors maybe get frustrated with the barking because you're, you know, it might be that they're on lead for, for, for a couple of weeks. That allows the situation to relax a little bit and rest a little bit. And it shows that you're doing something. And I think that that would be our second tip here is that um, ha have a conversation with your neighbors where that's appropriate. As long as it's not hostile, as long as you get on, you know, reasonably well, or you, you know, you or even if you feel it's uncomfortable, write a little note. Yeah. So I think you could write a little note and, and where possible explain that you're training, you're trying really hard, you're working on it. And actually you appreciate their feedback. And at the same yeah. time, um, you're doing your very best. Yeah, exactly. So the second tip is actually turn it into a dialogue and show them that you are doing something because if you know, all they hear is are the barks um, and nothing else, then I can imagine that that can feel quite frustrating for them when actually they don't know all of the things that you are doing and that you're reaching out to us for help. So um, third tip, the reason why your dogs maybe bark in the garden, well, there's all kinds of different reasons. It may be if you've got a multi-dog household that they they like to chase each other and play with each other and the they're barking when up. they do that. Maybe they hear things in neighboring properties or, or they're reacting to, I don't know, the sound of birds and they're barking because of that. And um, maybe it might be that they, they kind of get excited about the next door neighbor having a barbecue and they get frustrated that they can't go and join in. The key is that they're all all kinds of emotions can drive barking, but the one emotion that will not drive barking, that will actually reduce barking, is promoting calmness. Now, how do we do that? So first off, for me, I do want to look at actually how my dog is spending all of their yeah. day and what are they doing in their day. Um, and for us, both Tom and I, we really like a quiet household. Yeah. So we actually are actively looking at this all day. So this is a 24-7 approach. This is not something that we go, okay, it's just what we do in the garden. This mm. is something I look at the whole household yeah. and how we're working. And you guys are listening to all of our podcasts. I know you're checking on on YouTube and some of you are probably even part of the training academy and sexy and a squirrel. So I know that this is a this is a wider approach here. But I think most of all, I'd be looking at what my dogs are doing each and every day. Yeah, absolutely. And so how they spend their time is how their brain is going to shape. So especially in a multi-dog household, it's really important that we think about this. And, and you know what? I fought this one because initially when Tom and I were both sort of working through, I was like, no, I want a really crazy high drive agility sports dog. Mm. Now I still have my crazy high drive agility Ferrari mm -hmm. and yet she's the most perfect dog to live with in the house and I think yeah. this is really important that you acknowledge our dogs are really brilliant at what they do and at the same time they are cool to live with um, in Absolutely. the house so calmness like really is what we're going for yeah. every room we want a bit more spa like yeah exactly and so what we what we would kind of urge you to do we love to do this we do this with our dogs all the time is we, we we watch them throughout a day and we just keep asking ourselves the question what they are doing right now is it growing them in a direction I want them to grow or is it growing them in a direction I don't want them to go so if you look at your two Labradors and they're wrestling with each other and rolling around um, in the maybe in the sitting room you ask yourself the question is this growing them in a direction I want them to grow or not it's quite easy to think actually that's probably something that maybe we should interrupt and redirect onto a different kind of activity one that might promote calmness like a, a long-lasting chew or some boundary games or something like that and in doing that what you do over time is you kind of tweak and tailor and you notice and you you, you observe and you you change things rather than kind of 
you're staying in that state of day-to-day firefighting. So you're adapting what your dog's doing each and every day in all of the spaces they spend mm-hmm. time. Now, um, this one's a huge topic, and I mean, it, it kind of almost warrants a podcast on its own, but as a whistle-stop tour, calm for us is a big, big deal. Yeah. And yet there's lots of things we do from enrichment to how we feed, when yeah. we feed, why we feed, the supplements yeah, we might absolutely. add, right? absolutely, because the, the, the other thing to consider is that there's a big link between your dog's digestive tract and what's going on in there and that colony of 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 microorganisms within that digestive tract what's going on in their brain in terms of the the levels of various neurotransmitters and also their behavior and um what we're really passionate about is training but also making sure that we're we're promoting calmness through what we feed as well and that's why we developed calm k9 that that daily um superfood supplement for your dogs that promotes calmness um, and that's why people that feed calm k9 they we get these crazy reviews I mean, about how there's been a 70 percent reduction reduction in barking it's, it's because huge. they feed that yeah, 70 percent plus reduction in barking just from feeding um a supplement that enhances training yeah. um, so you know the other, the other thing that that is is would be great to do is to say you know to to write to you you write your little note to your neighbors and tell them five things that you're doing and you say you know i'm feeding calm k9 i'm taking them out in the garden on lead i'm promoting calmness through their daily activities if i was your neighbor i'd be thinking my word okay this, this is, person is trying th- really this hard. is really great now the the next kind of tip that we've got for you on on the subject of calmness is actually implementing the calmness wheel or the calmness triad and this is about your dog spending time in a way that promotes calmness now each and every day your dog wakes up with number one a pot of energy and a pot of um sort of value right in in hand by hand in hand and we can use that value in so many different ways and what we mean by that is what we're going to promote on a day-to-day basis with our dogs now Mm -hmm. for my dogs chewing and um, having long-lasting chews and bones and and things like this is just one part of my calmness triad where I actually give them opportunities to effectively either scavenge, hunt, or chew. Mm. Now, scavenging would be scatter feeding for my dogs and hunting would be hunting yeah. for um, hunting for food. And chewing long-lasting chews is something I find really, really enriching for them, Tom. Mm-hmm. But also, I find it's actually quite calming for me. Yeah. So I find it quite calming to sit and watch them. Yeah. So my dogs have some time each and every day, whether they're chewing something like an antler covered in coconut oil mm. or whether they're chewing something like a, a bone stuffed with tripe, it smells delightful or um, and obviously I can I can pop my supplements in there too which is mm-hmm. really really cool or whether it's chewing something like a venison bone which mm-hmm. is what my guys enjoyed yesterday actually I've got so many different options there but part of their day is doing that and if you're a, a, a raw feeder or a, you've ditched the bowl in, in different ways actually there's still ways you can do that mm. there's so many different I mean we've, we've got we've got so many different resources um, on, on these things and there are ways to do it however you feed exactly exactly and so um, what we'd say is kind of we'd like to signpost you to a lesson that we prepared for you over on our YouTube channel there is a whole episode on our YouTube channel um, about calmness and how to promote calmness um, and the calmness wheel so if you head over to youtube search absolute dogs and then look for the calmness episode there's a new episode each and every week so you should subscribe while you're over there now um the the kind of final tip because we don't want to kind of leave you in a state of overwhelm we want to make sure that you kind of got the tips got the the actionable steps and that you go forth and transform your dogs and is actually to promote this concept of disengagement within the garden now gardens especially in built up areas they're quite a weird concept for dogs you know dogs don't really naturally get barriers they can hear things that that behind barriers and they can't get to those things it can be quite a scary place it can be quite a frustrating place it can be a place where they want to engage with things outside of the perimeter of your garden and so um, what we'd um, challenge you to do is with your dogs on lead whether it's one or multiple actively spend some time with them and every time they orient away from from the fence line every time they turn to look at you maybe just feed them a little bit every time and this can be part of the daily food this does not have to be extra special treats this can be part of your your ditch the bowl your enrichment your daily training and maybe when they maybe then when you do some off lead work maybe when they're sniffing by the boundary but then they walk away from the boundary making sure that you're feed 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 feeding them for doing that because what that does is promote this concept of value away from the boundaries and the boundaries are what are triggering this arousal in some situations and so actively encouraging that promoting that using your dog's daily food allowance you'll be it's so simple and yet you'd be surprised how your dog's behavior and that how they choose to spend their time in that in that garden 
garden is transformed. Our dogs, when they're in the garden, and they can hear people, they can hear other dogs in the vicinity, they can hear, you know, farm animals, um, and yet they're not, they're not spending, they're not even spending any time around the gates or around the fence line. They're in the middle of the garden, they're chilled, they're relaxed, they're sleeping, uh, but they wouldn't be able to chilled, be chilled, relaxed and sleeping if they were focusing outside of the garden. So you've first got to promote this concept of disengagement from all those things in the vicinity and then calmness comes naturally. And I think lastly, before we leave you, and, and like Tom said, we really don't want to overwhelm you, I think most of all, look at what your dog is doing mm, yeah. and just to reiterate, what they rehearse, they become. So don't allow them to rehearse in the garden the things you don't like, whether mm. that be digging in holes uh, or whether that be racing at the fence or whether that would be lunging, jumping, barking, bouncing, mm. whatever it might be. I think that it's really important that you consider what they're doing and actually mm-hmm. interrupting it yeah. so if you don't like it just like tom said very very early on here what they what they're doing they will do more of mm-hmm. right what they rehearse they become yeah. and what dogs do each and every day they will continue to do so you have the say there you don't have to sit and listen to that and um, i'm always I'm, I'm i genuinely am always surprised when i'm sat upstairs and i can hear the next door dog barking at the fence or, or continuing to bark and i'm like why does no one hear it? Like, like, don't allow them to continue it. If you don't, if you want them to behave differently in the garden and to be calmer generally, actually go and interrupt those mm-hmm. things and don't allow those things to yeah. continue. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So with that, guys, we've covered a lot. You, to be honest, I bet everybody listening to some extent can think there's a space that their dog spends time in, where whether it's the garden or whether it's a room of the house or you know whether it's a, a patio or a balcony or whatever it might be, where you'd like your dog to maybe behave a little bit differently and these are the tips that are going to get you there right these are the tips that are going to bridge that gap of where you are right now and where you want to be we will see you in the next episode of the sexier than a squirrel podcast it's going to be a good one in the meantime remember stay Stay sexy. sexy Hey, before you go, have you taken part in the worldwide Sexier Than a Squirrel Challenge? It's a 25-day online video programme, huge energy, amazing community, and over 6,000 people are already taking part. The only question is, you know where you are today, where do you want to be 25 days from now? Head to absolutedogs.me forward slash sexy.